All right. Um, in this particular video, I want to start. Um, oh, basically, this is, this is going to kind of tee off a, a few videos that I want to do on the urinary system. Um, in this one, I'm basically going to introduce the urinary system and talk about its basic functions and so on, and go from there. But um, you know, again, basically, this is a um, a system that's extremely important to know and understand because there's a lot of people out there with uh, urinary system issues, uh, you know, whether it's kidney failures or, or others. Um, and just physiologically, this is an extremely important system that helps us regulate some very key aspects of our life. And without this system, um, well, there would be no life, at least not for very long. Okay, so basically what I'd like to do, now I'm not going to do all this in this video, but kind of my goal over these next few videos I'm going to make uh, is to cover all these topics. In this particular video, I'm going to cover the, uh, the functions of the urinary system and the gross anatomy of the urinary system. Um, and then in the next video, what I'd like to do is talk about the physiologic anatomy, you know, the microscopic functional anatomy of the um, of the kidneys and then depending on how long that takes I may keep that to one video um, or I will break or include this into there if not then this is this is a this is a video that I know a lot of people are going to want to watch just because um, I get a lot of requests on this and this is this is the stuff that confuses people about the kidneys basically all the microscopic functional aspects of the kidneys and it's really it's really not that hard to understand if you have a good clear-cut understanding of the purpose of the kidneys in the urinary system and basically um, just if you just kind of having a you know a good imagination with all things molecular and just break it down appropriately and I will uh, do my best to do that for you guys and then a little bit about the importance you know some clinical aspects obviously I, I'll throw these in as I go but the importance of understanding basically urine its properties and the and the clinical value that urine can play when it comes to assessing um, a patient's well-being especially with their urinary system Okay, so again, in this particular video, I'm going to be focusing on these two top these, these top two bullet points in this one: the functions of the urinary system, and then the gross anatomy of the system. And then I'll show make other videos with these other topics. Okay, so the urinary system anatomically, um, the gross anatomy of this system I think is the simplest of any any in the body. Um, what it really boils down to is you've got two kidneys. For the most part, some people only have one, two ureters, not ureters, and you've got one urinary bladder, and you've got one urethra. That's the that's the urinary system in a nutshell. Okay, the, at least the gross anatomy of it. Obviously, there's more to it than this. But in, when I say gross anatomy, basically the larger aspects of the anatomy that you can see and assess and observe with your own with your eyes and hands, you know, easily without the use of a microscope or other viewing objects. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, I'm still coming over whatever um, is ailing me here. So if I cough or have a dry voice or sound choky, that's why. That's yeah, the problem with uh, teaching when you when you uh, have a sore throat or get a respiratory problem and your job revolves around talking for hours upon hours per day. It's not quite easy to heal from that. So, so I apologize if I cough and hack or if I sound raspy or whatever. So, um, but again, you know, so so anatomically it's relatively simple. So again, you can see the you know that you can see the the two kidneys right here. These tubes, basically these long yellow tubes passing from the kidneys down the abdomen into the pelvic cavity are the ureters and then the ureters essentially are what connect the kidneys to the urinary bladder. Okay, and then the urethra is the passageway for urine out of the bladder to, well, essentially wherever you're aiming. Um, so, I mean, like I said, that's really what this system is composed of. It's not all that bad. Um, a lot less complex than a system like, um, you know, like the digestive system or the muscle, the muscular system or the skeletal system where there's just a lot more structures to look at. Obviously, there's more aspects of these to take a look at, but that's the urinary system in a nutshell. Two kidneys, two ureters, a urinary bladder, and a urethra. Okay, and we'll break these down more as we go, but that's the urinary system. I mean, you know, in terms of just what it's generally composed of. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, the functions of the kidneys are 
I mean, the, the kidneys basically are regulatory and excretory organs of the human body, okay? So they're regulatory and excretory organs of the human body, okay? And like most other organs of the body, there's, there is some endocrine aspect to them, but that's not the primary function of the kidneys. That's just a secondary function that, that, that plays into um, what the kidneys do. Okay, so basically, um, the basically the, what the kidneys do is they essentially regulate body water level. They they, they regulate. Uh, let's, not, let's go a little step farther than that. The kidneys regulate the composition of plasma. The kidneys regulate the composition of plasma. Okay, so we say body fluids here. I mean, essentially the plasma. Okay, the you know the water of your blood. All right, um, and basically there are two major components of that um, of of these body fluids or plasma that the kidneys are regulating, and basically that's going to be the water itself, okay, and any kind of metabolic wastes that are found within there, okay. So the kidneys, and that's where the excretory as the, the the excretory aspect of the kidneys come in, because it's very important that the kidneys eliminate these wastes. Now there are there are there are other organs or tissues of the body that have excretory functions to them, you know, eliminating waste. Because for example, example we can eliminate waste via sweat. Okay, we can eliminate, you know, we eliminate waste through breathing, you know, carbon dioxide. Okay, um, you know, there's, you know, I mean, you know, some fecal matter is waste. Okay, but different forms or of waste are being removed from these, you know, from these areas of the body. Okay, whereas with the kidneys, the kidneys are actually filtering the blood. The kidneys are filtering organs. Okay, um, the kidneys are the filtering organs of the urinary system, and the kidneys also do the bulk of the work of the urinary system. That's why we spend the bulk of our time talking about the kidneys. So the kidneys essentially are performing these functions, the regulatory and excretory functions, okay, and, and the secretory functions, okay, so the kidneys are uh, filtering the blood, they're filtering out excessive water, excessive waste, or just waste in general, I should say, and then, and, and then forming urine out of that, and then basically the rest of the structures of the urinary system, we take a step back here for a sec. So he, so we've got the filtering organs here. All right. So we filter blood, and then all, and then all the urine and all the stuff that we filtered out of the blood is trapped in, or we process and form urine out of it, stored in the urinary bladder till it gets full, and then we excrete and eliminate that waste. Okay. Oops. All right. So that's basically the. These are the main functions of the kidneys. All right, and also part of this is reabsorbing useful materials back into the bloodstream as well. You're going to learn as we go through this that, um, you know, it, just because the kidneys are filtering blood doesn't mean that we need to get rid of everything that we filter. Okay, oftentimes, you know, the, the, the filtration pressures in the kidneys are relatively high in the capillaries in the kidneys, and that tends to make us force a lot of material out we don't necessarily want to urinate out or excrete out of the body. So it's important that we reabsorb that back into the bloodstream. And um, at the same time, we also need to secrete excess waste that didn't get filtered out of the blood and in the kidneys as well. It's part of the processing aspect in making urine. And you're going to see all this much later on. Okay, so the kidney's primary job is excreting waste, um, regulating body water levels. And a big part of all of this as well, especially when it comes to the water regulation aspect of this, that's also a very key regulator in blood pressure. The kidneys are the largest regulators of blood pressure within the human body. Okay, um, or they, they, you know, that you know, in conjunction with the heart and the nervous system as well. But by controlling the volume of blood, by controlling the, you know, the water content of blood, the kidneys are very powerful regulators of this. And at the same time, the kidneys are also very powerful regulators of pH. Okay, you know, there's basically three different mechanisms that we use to regulate pH, and they're broken down into two separate categories, what are called chemical buffers and physiologic buffers. Remember, by definition, a buffer is uh, basically anything that's used to resist a change in pH. Okay, and, you know, we have chemical buffers, because remember, pH revolves around hydrogen ions, right? Chemical buffers combine with these hydrogen ions to buffer the, you know, the excessive amounts of hydrogen in the system. Um, 
you know, the, with the, you know, with the respiratory system, we can exhale carbon dioxide, which remember carbon dioxide acts as an acid in the, you know, in our system as we circulate it around. And, but the, the kidneys themselves can directly eliminate hydrogen ions in the urine and play the largest role in directly keeping our pH down. Okay, so kidneys are very powerful regulators of pH as well. Okay, and then kidneys can um, secrete, you know, chem you know, chemical messages and enzymes. Remember, renin is an enzyme, okay, and, you know, to basically help us regulate our blood volume and other components. Okay, renin essentially is an enzyme that is, that we use to get our blood pressure back up when our, when our, when our sodium and water content is low, all right. Erythropoietin, or otherwise known as EPO, all right, is a hormone, you know, remember poiesis is, you know, you know is the, the clinical term poiesis, think of that as a term to, to, to manufacture, to make, okay, you know, and then erythro, well, you're thinking red blood cells, okay, so this is a hormone that, that stimulates the production of red blood cells and red bone marrow, okay, and that's why athletes love taking this as a performance enhancing drug, because you pump yourself full of EPO, get your hematocrit up, um, utilize oxygen better, and you perform at a higher level, unless you overdose on EPO, and then you, um, your blood, your viscosity, your blood getting your hematocrit gets too thick, and then as a result, it's like sludge flowing through your circulatory system, and that's going to be detrimental. So in a nutshell, just be successful in sports the old-fashioned way, just work hard. Um, the other reason why athletes love EPO is because it clears out of the system really fast. Um, and then this 1,2,5-dihydroxycholecalciferol, that's the high-class term for basically calcitriol, or the active, the, the hormonally active form of vitamin D, okay? And basically, this is designed to increase our um, ability to absorb calcium in the GI tract, okay? So the kidneys uh, have a lot of functions to them, but the two major functions are going to be the, you know, I mean, again, you know, these are very general important functions, but what are we regulating? You know, volume, you know, basically, you know, and volume and composition of fluids, okay? And we regulate these fluids by, you know, by regulating the levels of water and then the composition of waste and other materials as well. The kidneys, ex you know, excrete more than just waste. The kidneys can excrete, you know, excess sodium, excuse me, excess sodium, sugar, electrolytes, I mean, anything that we need to eliminate out of the body that's in excess and the kidneys are capable of doing so, they'll do so. All right, and then also pH regulation is a very important function, which I'll talk about in another video. Okay, so those essentially are the functions of the urinary system, um, or, you know, basically the kidneys. I mean, like, I, you know, I've, I've said this once, and I'll say it again. I mean, the bulk of this discussion on this organ system is going to revolve around the kidneys, because the kidneys really are the functional aspects of the system. The rest of the system is just about um, storing urine until we're ready to eliminate it. So the kidneys are what are doing the work in creating urine and, and keeping the blood clean and um, getting rid of those wastes. Okay, now a big part of those wastes that we're trying to get rid of, those wastes, you know, one of, I want to talk about this for a second just because nitrogenous wastes are very important to eliminate from the body, okay, nitrogen-based wastes, okay. Um, you know, a lot of these nitrogenous wastes come from protein metabolism, we're catabolizing or breaking down proteins, okay. Remember that uh, um, proteins are molecules that contain amino acids. Okay, and amino acids, unlike glucose and fat, okay, or lipids, I should say, um, amino acids contain uh, nitrogen, the building blocks of protein. They contain nitrogen within them. Okay, and before we really can do anything with that nitrogen, uh, with that protein as we're metabolizing it, we it's very important that we basically process and prepare to eliminate um, that nitrogen that is within the amino acid first, okay? If we don't, that could lead to some bad news if we accumulate nitrogen in the system. So the kidneys are essentially playing a, you know, they play a big role in eliminating the waste products of protein metabolism, these nitrogenous wastes, okay? Um, <coughs> excuse me. So remember... That, so if you want to take a look at an amino acid, so remember you've got carbon, hydrogen,
Okay, amino acid. All right, so here would be what's called a carboxyl group. And then this would be the amino group. Okay, and then within the amino group of this amino acid, essentially, there is a nitrogen that, oh, whoops, I didn't realize I did that. Sorry. Okay. Um, there, I get my bearing straight here. All right. So basically, what we have here is the on the amino the amino group of um, uh, of an amino acid again has it, it contains nitrogen with two hydrogen ions. Um, you know, uh, uh, interacting with this hydrogen, and you know, remember this is the I mean, this is the acid aspect of this. You know, because we can. Uh, combine or disassociate these hydrogen ions, okay? And then the carboxyl group is just a structural, you know, the, another structural component of this. And then basically this R, remember, stands for the side chain, which basically that's, you know, the, there's 20 different variations that um, of these side chains that, um, he, you know, the, which make up 20 different amino acids that are of use to us humans, okay? So when we're metabolizing these proteins, what we have to do is we have to basically this is the part we need to deal with. We need to get rid of that nitrogen, okay? And basically that's done in the liver, you know, via what's called the urea cycle. Um, and basically, you know, what we do is we remove this group and then we form ammonia in the liver. Okay, we form ammonia. All right, and then once we form that ammonia, all right, we form that ammonia, we have to basically, and then we, then we tack on some other molecules, and then we wind up forming uh, the molecule urea. Okay, and that's why urine is called urine, because of the you know, urea that's in it. Okay, so and then we circulate this urea in the bloodstream, where it'll eventually flow to the kidneys, and then the kidneys will filter this urea out, and then we will urinate it out. Okay, so, you know, urea, very common me metabolic waste that comes as a result of protein metabolism. We need to get rid of this. Okay, um, and, if we, and if we are unable to do so, and we start accumulating this waste product or any of these other waste products in our system, and then we can develop, you know, you know we have nitrogen toxicity and other, um, other very, uh, um, just basically bad metabolic complications come from this, and then basically this is just going to, I mean, kill the body, shut it down. All right. <clears throat> so it's very important that our kidneys are able to filter all this waste out because, I mean, as long as we're alive, we're going to be continuously metabolizing uh, organic molecules in our system, and we have to, and you know that whenever we are rearranging molecules, we do form waste that we need to get rid of. Okay, and um, uric acid comes from nucleic acid metabolism, and you know I bring this up because uric acid is is, is a is a very common part of gout. Okay, I mean people that have gouty arthritis. All right, so basically with, when when people have gout, what happens is they um, as they accumulate these uric and the uric uric acid can accumulate in the joints and it kind of crystallizes. And then those little crystal shards kind of uh, do a lot of damage to the to the to the inside of the joints, and that causes and the, of the capsules and so on, and that ca and, and and that causes a lot of inflammation, uh, very uncomfortable inflammation uh, to those joints. I mean, you know, I mean, if you ever know if you know anybody that's got gouty arthritis, it's a very you know pretty painful condition. All right, and I bring this up because remember the kidneys are an excretory organ, right? All these products here are designed to get. You know, we want to eliminate them from the body. We want to excrete them out of the body. Okay, now, now, if you know anybody who has gout, okay, if you know anybody that has gout, you know, I mean, you know, what diet should they have? I mean, did you, do you know, if you know anybody, you know, any of you listeners out there, if you know someone that has this condition, you'll notice that their diet is very low on meat, especially red meats and the oily kind of fatty meats. Okay, um... And low alcohol intake, all right, because, you know, you get it, you can accumulate it, you can build up a lot of uric acid from eating excessive amounts of meat in your system. Um, and then basically the alcohol intake, what happens here is that, remember, as we metabolize alcohol, your liver is going to produce more lactic acid. 
Okay, and then as as the blood lactic acid level rise, uh, rise, and again the mechanism for this, based on research I've done, I haven't been able to find a really solid explanation as to how this works. Um, but basically, what the, what what's been shown is that as as lactic acid levels tend to rise in the blood, it's harder for the kidneys to excrete uric acid from the body. So you start to accumulate uric acid in your system. And I say this, you know, and an example of this, I, use, I have a family member that had gout for a long time, very uncontrollable gout. I mean, didn't matter what, uh, what adjustments to the medications they made, dietary adjustments that were made, it was just always out of control. And, um, and then what wound up happening is this family member of mine had, um, you know, I was still, I, I didn't know much about any of this at the time because I was, you know, younger uh, when, when this was all going on. And then I kind of started digging into this a little more because it made me curious. But what wound up happening was this family member of mine had a, had a, a pretty big stroke. And then, as, and then as a result of that, basically wasn't allowed to smoke, drink, obviously had to be very, very um, stringent about the diet. Okay. And then all of a sudden... You know, once once the drinking got cut out, all of a sudden, I mean, one flare up in the last few years of gout. Okay, because you know this this particular family member was pounding alcohol like it was nobody's business, and um, so basically, once the alcohol in, and that was the problem with the with the with the person was that the alcohol intake was so high that that the that the person wasn't clearing out the uric acid like like they should have been, and then as a result, just had these constant complications with gout. Okay, so, you know, that's why those people who have gout are on those diets in the first place to allow the kidneys to get rid of all this uric acid that can potentially accumulate in the system. And then creatinine essentially comes from creatine phosphate catabolism. Creatine phosphate is basically a molecule that's used by tissues that need really, really, really rapid, quick forms of energy. You know, like muscle and nervous tissue just burn through this stuff like crazy. And then you, and then creatinine is a waste product that can work its way into the bloodstream and, um, <laughs> that we need to get rid of. Now, I'm bringing this up because if you need to assess a person's, you know, kidney function, obviously you can look at their urine, but you need to check their blood as well. Okay, so, and, and let's talk about this for a second because, remember, kidneys are excretory organs. Remember, excretory, removing substances from the body. So if a person's kidneys are failing for whatever reason, what do you think is going to happen to the levels of these items in the blood? What's going to happen to the levels of these in the bloodstream? What do you think? Are they going to go up or are they going to go down? They're going to go up. Because if your kidneys are failing, if your kidneys are unable to do their job, if they're unable to filter blood appropriately and form urine appropriately and allow us to eliminate that urine, well, if you can't form urine, you can't eliminate it, okay, then these substances are just going to accumulate in the body fluids, like we said earlier. You mean, that's, a, you know, that's what the kidneys are all about, maintaining a stable environment in the body, in, in basically in their bodily fluids and plasma, okay? So then clinically, the clinical importance of this then is if these levels start to just continuously rise, continuously rise, well, that's going to be an indication that their kidneys are probably going south. And then what's going on? What's causing the kidneys to go south? What's causing them a person to undo, uh, undergo renal failure like this? Okay, and that's basically what this test is all about here. BUN, blood urea nitrogen, that's what that stands for. Okay, blood urea nitrogen. So you're assessing the blood levels of these of these of these specific metabolic waste products, and if they're if they just continuously rise when they normally should go down in a person or should be lower, then that's going to be a problem. That person has kidney issues. Then you try to have, then you have to figure out well what is the cause of this. Okay, and then if and then as this develops, that's when you're going to say well they're they're developing azotemia. They're accumulating these. Um, they're accumulating these, they're specifically accumulating these waste products in the bloodstream itself. And then when we say a person has uremia, that literally means urine in the blood. Okay, and then that produce, that's going to produce these very toxic effects of accumulating these wastes in the system. So, um, so that's essentially um, what we use these, you know, essentially what we use the kidneys for. And the, and the importance of understanding these specific um, markers that can be used in the bloodstream to filter out these wastes. Okay. 
using the bloodstream to assess kidney function. Sorry. All right. So that's a little bit of the functionality of the kidneys. Now let's talk about the anatomy of the kidneys. Okay. The kidneys um, anatomically are retroperitoneal. Okay, retroperitoneal. All right. Well, now on average, 160 grams a pop, about the size of a bar of Irish Spring. Um, okay. And um, let's talk about this term retroperitoneal and them being at the level of uh, T12 to L3. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to this. Oops, jump ahead to this picture here first. Excuse me for a second. All right. Okay. So, again, we've got the. So, we said the kidneys are at about the level of. E12. So let's say these are ribs. All right. About the upper one third of kidneys are protected by what are called the floating ribs. <coughs> Sorry, the floating ribs. Okay. Remember, the floating ribs are the are the the the, the bottom two or the, the the bottom pair of ribs. You know, the the, the ribs uh, eleven and twelve on each side that are not they're not attached to they're not attached anteriorly to anything. On the vertebral aspect, are obviously attached to the vertebrae, but there is no anterior attachment to the costal cartilages of uh, a cartilage of rib seven or any of the other costal cartilage of the sternum. So as a result, they're just kind of floating there in the you know in in the abdominal thoracic area. And then what's nice about having them there, even though they don't really play any functional role in breathing, by having these solid bony structures. Um, just dipping down a little lower here, that allows for some protection of these soft organs that are located um, underneath them. Okay, so about the upper third of the kidneys are protected by these ribs. And again, they're at the level of about um, T12, thoracic vertebrae number 12, to about L3, all right, around that area. Okay, now when I said the kidneys are retroperitoneal, all right, there's a piece of, there's, there's this very important layer of connective tissue called the, oh my gosh, I can't spell today. The peritoneum. The peritoneum. The peritoneum basically is kind of a, well, you, you know, whenever you guys are doing dissections, whether you're dissecting a human cadaver, whether you're dissecting a cat, whether you're dissecting a pig, when you're, when you're taking a class like this and, and um, learning about this material, what you need to be doing is when you first make your incision into the abdomen, what you should do is you should, for starters, try to do this as thin as possible. Try to very carefully make your incisions in because you're going to notice there's this very whitish colored layer of tissue that just kind of surrounds most of, the, most of the aspects of the abdominal pelvic cavity and also is found surrounding most of the organs of the abdominal pelvic cavity as well. Not all, but most. Okay, and then what you should do is you should kind of stick your stick your finger in there, your hand in there, depending on what size of an organism you're dissecting, and try to push all these guts or all these parts aside, and then ob observe the, the the lateral wall on either side, whichever side you're looking at, of the abdominal cavity. You'll see this kind of white, shiny-looking tissue around, you know, the, and you see how it's surrounding the entire abdominal cavity, you know, kind of a 360 degree, um, in, in a three-dimensional fashion here. Okay, and that is the peritoneum. Now, not every organ within the abdominal cavity is located within or inside of that peritoneum. There are a couple of organs or parts of organs that are located outside of that peritoneum. They're not only outside of the peritoneum, they are behind the peritoneum. Hence the term retroperitoneal. The kidneys are retroperitoneal. So basically, if you were to cut into the abdomen, and if you were to remove the liver, the stomach, the, the, the small and large intestine, okay, what you would see is you would see, basically what you would see, the, ki the kidneys are going to be visible. But you're going to see this little whitish film covering the, you know, covering the kidneys and the posterior wall of the abdominal cavity. And the reason why you can't see the kidneys in full view because they're behind that peritoneum. And then if you were to make your incision into the peritoneum and kind of, you know, retract it to the sides, then you would get a full view of the kidneys. So anatomically, the kidneys are behind, um, they're behind the peritoneum, all right, hence the term retroperitoneal. The, um, 
The pancreas and the uh, duodenum of the small intestine, uh, not duodenum, I hate when people say duodenum, it's pronounced duodenum. The, you guys don't know what the, the pancreas is, um, you know, it's that mixed gland that plays a role in, um, that has endocrine and exocrine functions that is found kind of tucked up right against the duodenum, the first eight inches of the small intestine. Okay, so those organ structures are retroperitoneal, um, you know, those three structures, okay? So that's something to keep in mind. Now, you'll notice, you know, I mean, notice what I mean, we're talking about human anatomy and physiology. So you'll notice here that the kidneys are suspended up in, up in the abdominal cavity as well, okay? And then suspended just above the kidneys are what are called suprarenal glands, otherwise known as your adrenal glands. Okay, think of adrenaline, renal, ad renal. Well, you guys all know your, your medical terminology. Remember, reno means kidney. Okay, reno means kidney. <coughs> all right, so if we say suprarenal gland or adrenaline, okay, that's a chemical, that's a hormone or, a, you know, a catecholamine essentially that is secreted from this gland. Okay, so these suprarenal glands are like these little caps that sit atop of the kidneys. Now, and they really don't play any real uh, functional role in the kidneys. They're just located um, within the superior aspect of, or on top of the kidneys. Okay, not within, but on top of the kidneys. Okay, so keep that in mind about the suprarenal glands. Um, now, the kidneys are held in place by some supportive connective tissue. Okay, some supportive connective tissues. Um, surrounding, directly surrounding the kidney is, um, is a piece of tissue that's called the renal capsule. The renal capsule, okay. Think of that as just like a piece of saran wrap, just, or cellophane wrap, just kind of just conforming to the shape of the kidney. All right, and if you were to, if you get a fresh kidney, um, you know, sometimes you order kidneys from biologic companies, you know, uh, this, uh, the capsule's been removed so they can process the kidneys. Um, but if you're, you know, if you're getting your kidneys from a butcher shop um, for the purpose for the use in lab, they're going to have that's going to be intact, and that might be ideal if you can pull that off and uh, you know get the kidneys in a timely manner, and not have to save them for too long, um, because you know they'll start to stink after a while. But you get to see that full view of that capsule, and what's what's important about that capsule is we can say that capsule. Um, compartmentalizes the kidneys. So we can say that capsule compartmentalizes the kidneys. There, think of this as another word for this would be isolates. Okay. This isn't the only organ. I mean, when you learned about the respiratory system, you talked about the pleural membranes, you learned about this as well. Okay, at least you should have learned or heard this word before. Okay, but if we have this wrapping around the kidneys, okay, um, this tissue is going to isolate the kidneys essentially from the rest of the body. Now, that's especially important when it comes to infections. Okay, by having that capsule present on there, it makes it hard for an infection in the kidney to actually get out and spread out to the rest of the body. I mean, you know, when, person, when, a, when a person gets a UTI, that's when an organism i.e. bacteria, works its way up the urethra and gets into the urinary bladder and infects the urinary system. And then sometimes they can get all the way up to the kidneys. All right, but they typically won't go much farther than that, one, just because it's going to be pretty agonizing by, it gets to be, by the time it gets to that point in time. But two, that tissue capsule will prevent the um, organ of the bacteria from directly just working their way right out of the kidneys. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, you'll notice, um, as you take a look at this, that the right kidney sits a, man, this picture doesn't do a lot of justice, but you notice the, the right kidney sits a tad lower than the left. Okay, the reason why it's a little lower to the left because of this organ right here, the liver. The liver, you know, this, you know, this right lobe of the, of the liver is just so big that it pushes the right kidney down just a hair lower in the abdominal cavity. So that's something to keep in mind. So if you're, uh, you know, going into, if you want to go into surgery or whatnot, or, you know, not even surgery, but, you know, scanning or anything like that, you know, you're going to need to understand that that's why the right kidney is always going to be a hair lower. All right. Um, 
and also so we got the renal capsule um you know that the, this cellophane wrap that kind of surrounds the kidneys and then next what you're going to see there's going to be this adipose tissue or this fat that surrounds that basically engulfs the kidneys and holds it in place and this fat is going to be called one second This fat is going to be called pararenal fat. Pararenal fat. Okay, now this fat is a little different. Um, it, this, fat is going to, this fat is a little different than um, what you would think of as subcutaneous fat, the fat that's going to be located underneath the skin. Um, just because, you know, the, the fat underneath the skin is more for energy storage purposes and so on, whereas this fat is a lot more solid and tough, and its main purpose is to hold the kidneys in place and protect them. Okay, so this fat is a physical presence that's there, to, that's there just to physically support the kidneys, not really to be used as an energy source, um, like subcutaneous fat. And then the last bit of connective tissue that's going to support the kidneys is also the most superficial, and that's going to be basically the renal fascia, okay? And this and that fascia essentially just, you know, like with fascia and muscle, just kind of anchors the kidneys in place, okay? Just like fascia anchors the muscles together, anchors the, anchors the muscle groups in place, okay? So you put all that connective tissue together, and you have basically, you're, you're able to hold the kidneys in one spot. Now, just this picture right here, it it kind of does a really good job of illustrating why it's important that the kidneys are suspended the way they are in the abdominal cavity. Because bear in mind that being that we are um, vertical, not horizontal creatures, you know, biped versus a quadruped. Okay, you can see right here. This is the renal artery, and then this is the renal vein. Okay, if these, if if this, if something were to go wrong with this supportive connective tissue and these kidneys were to start to wander in the abdominal cavity, you could bend or twist or tear these vessels, and that's going to cause a person to lose a lot of blood. Okay, because one thing you have to remember, remember, being that the, again, that the kidneys are filtering organs of the body, okay, filtering organs of the blood, we circulate 25% of our cardiac output just to the kidneys. Remember, cardiac output is the volume of blood circulated out of the heart per minute. Okay, and if we say the average person has a blood volume of about five liters, okay, that means one and a quarter liter is just going to the kidneys every minute. Okay, so that can lead to some pretty to some significant blood loss if you're if these vessels become damaged or torn. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. And they call that nephroptosis, wandering kidney. All right, wandering kidneys. Okay, and then again, uh, so then, and then you've got the ureters, which transport urine down to the urinary bladder. That urine is going to be stored, and then it will be eventually eliminated out of the out of the bladder as well. So let's just take a quick look at the urinary bladder. Um, and you know, again, I'm going to go into this in depth more in another video. But you know, so again, you saw the ureters come on down, and the ureters attach to the bladder posteriorly. And then they open through these orifices, these urinal openings. Um, and basically, there's another opening here, basically this internal ure uh, urethral orifice. And when you when you draw a shape here, you get a triangle. And that's and then basically this triangle here is called the trigone of the urinary bladder. Okay, and then surrounding the kidneys is going to be you know so you know this fibrous connective tissue that is used just to kind of support and anchor the, the kidney, the urinary bladder. And then the middle aspect of the kidney is surrounded by this circular smooth muscle called the detrusor muscle. And that's something to that keep in mind again because later on in another video I want to talk about the micturition reflex or the reflex basically that we use to unload our bladder or go pee, all right, or urinate. And then Basically, the, the inner mucosal lining of the urinary bladder basically is what's in direct contact with the urine and also is lined with transitional epithelium, just like the inner lining just like the inner lining of the um, ureters, they're lined with that transitional epithelium. And remember, remember transitional epithelium um, 
is this epithelial tissue that's composed of round cells, and then when you apply pressure or force to these cells, they can adapt by kind of stretching out. Okay, going from circular to kind of flat in shape, and that's good because when you want to, when you're constantly filling an organ like this with urine, it allows it to expand, and you can pack more urine in there until you have to empty it. So that's kind of the advantage of that. And then again, you've got the urethra, and then there's a, basically an, ex, an internal and an external sphincter that is used to control the opening, and that's what sphincters do. These basically, they're muscles that control the openings of passageways. And one thing to keep in mind about these sphincters is that the internal sphincter is composed of smooth muscle, and the external sphincter is skeletal muscle. So what does that tell you right there? What does that tell you? that the internal sphincter is involuntary and the external is voluntary. Okay, so that's something just to think about. Again, I'm going to come back to this concept a little later on. But again, that kind of, that's kind of just a gross anatomic review of the kidneys and the urinary system within the abdominal cavity. Now let's start breaking down the kidneys with a little more depth. Okay, so here essentially is a pig kidney that I had um, my students, uh, we dissected kidneys the other day and I took some photos to throw in this presentation. Okay, now when you're looking at a kidney, kidneys have a convex curve and they have an inward concave curve as you can see here. The convex or the outwardly curved aspect of the kidneys always faces the lateral aspect of the abdominal cavity, whereas the convex, or I'm sorry, convex, the concave, the, inward, the inwardly curved part of the kidney always faces medially okay, towards the middle of the abdomen, okay, and remember when you saw that image earlier, you saw the aorta coming down, let's try that, okay, my markers are going nuts here, okay, so you get to see the aorta, do, 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 do. and then here's a vessel, and then that vessel opened into the, you know, went into the kidneys like so, hopefully your kidneys don't look like that, but you get the picture, so the inner concave aspect of the kidneys always faces medially, the outer convex aspect of the kidneys face laterally. And then right here, there's, you know, where there, this is the high traffic area of the kidney called the hilum. Okay, the hilum of the kidney. Okay, remember we were talking about the lungs, um, you know, in, in class before. And basically what, you know, when I, I like to think of a hilum as a high traffic area of an organ. Okay, the hilum of the, of the lungs, you have the bronchial, you have the, 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 primary or principal bronchioles um, going into the lungs. You've got the pulmonary arteries branching into the lungs from there and the pulmonary veins exiting the lungs all in that same area. Okay, so a lot of traffic in and out. Here in the hilum of the kidney, basically there's a few, there's a few objects that are going into and out of the kidney here. Okay, basically one is going to be the renal artery Okay, that is going in the hilum. Well, the opposite of an artery, you've got to have a renal vein. Obviously, that's going out. And then also, you're going to have the ureter with, you know, one ureter per kidney. And that also is a structure traveling out of the kidney. And again, all these structures are going into and coming out of the hilum on the medial aspect of the kidney here. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind about just kind of the general surface anatomy of the kidneys. And let's start taking a look at the internal anatomy. So then, um, so basically, these were uh, yeah, these are pig kidneys, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that or not yet. Did I say that? Okay. Um, um, you know, so basically, with you know, and these kidneys are going to be very, very similar to human kidneys. Um, but obviously, you can't just go around getting human kidneys like they're nobody's business. So we got to get the pig ones. Um, so, but again, you're going to see a lot of parallels and similarities in the structures of the of the kidneys here. So basically, what I had them do is I had them cut around the. Um, so if, if this were a kidney, what I had them do is I had them make make their incision. Okay, around the um, around the convex lateral part of the kidney, and almost all the way around, and then I just had them slowly just continue to cut inward like so, and eventually form a, a, a mid sagittal section of the kidneys. Now, when we're looking at the kidneys here, and I'll have a I'll have a full view in a second here of the kidneys completely in half, but the first off, the kidney can be broken down into two. Um, discriminant areas, and those areas are going to be the renal cortex and the renal medulla. Okay, 
Now, before I continue with this, I want to talk about something just for a second here. The difference between renal, you know, the word root reno and nephro. Because, you know, when you take a medical terminology class, you know that, you know, they say that both of those mean kidney, which is true. But how they're used is a little different. Whenever you see reno, or when you know, or whenever you see you see this being used, renal, think of that as an anatomic, more of a gross anatomic term. Okay. Whereas when we use nephro, that's going to be more of a microscopic or a physiologic anatomic term. And also that's typically the what we're describing pathologies with the kidneys, nephro is the term is typically used to describe pathologies with the kidneys. So you're so in so for the rest of this video you're going to be hearing me say reno a lot because we're just talking about the gross anatomy. And the next one when I talk about the nephron, the microscopic structures of the kidneys, then it's going to be nephro a lot. So keep so kind of keep that little tidbit in the back of your mind. Okay. So I get asked that question a lot and it's just important that you guys kind of know that key little difference there. All right. So in saying that, then the kidney, as I, you know, and continuing on this, I said the kidney can be broken down into a renal cortex and a renal medulla. Okay. The cortex essentially is this outer tissue you see right here. Because remember, the word, you know, think of cortex as like bark. Okay. Or an outer covering. You know, you find bark on the outside of a tree covering the tree. Okay, whenever you see the word cortex, you should think that's an outer covering of an organ. You know, like, for example, the cerebral cortex or the adrenal cortex. Okay, Cor you know, cortex, 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 cortex. Okay, the outer covering of the organ. So this would be uh, all the renal cortex out here. And then, and then the other part, the renal medulla, that essentially means middle. Okay, so the inner at the inner aspects of the organ, the renal medulla. See these kind of darkish areas right here? These are what are called the renal pyramids. Okay, the renal pyramids. Okay, and the renal pyramids essentially make up the renal medulla. Okay, and then all of this white that you see here, these are all drainage channels called calyces, which we'll take a look at more individually in a second here. Okay. Um, and then again, here's just another perspective or another view of this. Again, you all know right here that this would be the renal cortex. This darker, deeper tissue would be a renal pyramid um, and part of the renal medulla. And then all of this, these are calyces or drainage channels. Now, one thing I want to tell you right now is um, I'm probably not going to get to it in this video just because it's starting to get kind of long. But I do want to make another video on the blood flow through the kidneys as well because we've already talked about these kidneys as being filtering organs. The renal cortex, this is where filtering, man, I can't spell today. This is where the filtering of blood occurs. That's where the filtering of blood takes place. Okay, so what we wind up doing is we wind up dispersing lots of small, tiny, microscopic blood vessels up into the, up into the cortex of the kidneys. And then this is where blood is essentially filtered. Okay, and then that's where, this is where most of urine production takes place as well in the microscopic anatomy of the kidneys and also a little bit of it in the renal medulla as well or in the pyramids. But eventually once we're done making urine, urine's going to drain down the pyramids into these individual channels um, that are located. Notice how you see these channels um, all along these pyramids here. Now, and again, I said that these are called calyces, okay? Calyces. Now, there are two forms of, there are basically two major types of a calyces or a calyx for singular form that you can find um, within the kidneys. A minor and a major calyx. And these are very easy to remember and understand. Okay. So a minor calyx, you know, minor meaning smaller, a minor calyx, you're going to see one calyx to one pyramid. Okay, so this essentially a minor calyx is essentially the individual drainage channel for the pyramid. So I said we do the filtering and most of the production of urine up in the cortex. And then once we basically make the urine in the microscopic structures of the kidneys, then that urine drains down through the pyramids and then into these individual channels for each pyramid, the minor calyx. Okay, and then in this area right here essentially would be a major 
calyx. And this is basically where two or more calyces join together. Okay, so, and, and people typically have about, you know, three or four of these major calyces. So keep that in mind. That's the easiest part. That's how you tell the difference between these two. Is a minor calyx is an individual drainage channel for a pyramid. A major calyx is where two or more minors come together. Okay. Now, here we actually have a mid-sagittal section of the kidneys. And again, you can see some of these major parts right here. Um, <coughs> now, so again, you guys all know what this is. This would be the renal cortex. We'll pressure it and use black with a black background. Okay, this would be the hilum. Okay, this would be the medulla. And also, that's also a renal pyramid. Okay, so here's a pyramid, 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 and so on. All right. Now, this little space, let me erase that. Where's my eraser going? Whoa, what happened? What in heaven's name just happened? Okay, looks like I have to. There we are. Whew. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that, folks. Um, okay. What was I going to say now? Oh, this little space. Notice how there's this little space right here between the um, between the the, the um, renal pyramid and this minor calyx here. This is called the renal papilla. Okay, the renal papilla. Okay, you know, papilla are kind of like this little nipple at the end of the pyramid here. All right, now essentially what's going to happen is that there are these microscopic ducts called collecting ducts that are going to drain all this urine that we made and they're going to collect all at this, this papilla or this, this, this very tip of the renal pyramid here. And then essentially what's going to happen then is obviously a urine is going to drain into this minor calyx. And then it's going to drain, obviously, into another minor calyx. And then it's going to sit here and then all this urine is going to collect then within this major calyx. And then obviously in this major calyx right here. Now, the, basically this area, okay, this area right here, would be where all of the major calyces come together, and that would essentially be the renal pelvis. Okay, the renal pelvis. Okay, so, and then the renal pelvis, essentially, you know, again, this bulge where all the drainage channels of the kidneys come together, and then what you're going to wind up forming is the ureter, which is going to basically branch out of the hilum and then descend down the abdominal cavity toward the urinary bladder. Okay, so this is very important that you just kind of understand this basic flow or pathway that urine takes. We circulate blood up into the cortex where it's filtered and processed, and then we make urine. Then it drains down through the, um, through the renal medulla and the pyramids in, you know, where it all collects in the, on the papillas, uh, these, these kind of nipples or projections at the ends of the pyramids where urine will then drain into a minor calyx. Remember, one drainage channel per pyramid. And then the urine is going to start to collect in these major calyces, and then eventually it's going to work its way to where all the major calyces come together, the renal pelvis. All right, and then the urine will flow down the ureter all the way to the urinary bladder, where it will be stored until the bladder gets filled to a certain capacity, and then we'll have to empty it. All right. So it's very important that you understand these basic anatomic features of the kidney because, you know, like I said, when it, cause when it, when it comes to understanding the microscopic aspect of these, um, you know, you have to, you know, you have to know, you, you have to get your bearings straight or else you're just going to be completely lost. Now, a couple other structures that I want to mention and then that'll be about it for this video. Um, there are spaces in between the pyramids that, um, that we like to call the renal columns. Okay, so the renal columns. 
Okay, the renal columns. Now these are going to be important to remember because th this is essentially our, you know, arteries. You know, basically as the renal artery works its way into the kidney, it's going to start to branch off into smaller vessels, and these vessels will eventually start to branch and pass up between the columns. Okay, and then they're going to kind of arc and wrap around the pyramids, and then start to, in a microscopic fashion, branch out in the cortex, where we're going to have a very large surface area to filter this blood. All right, now. This what, another thing we're looking at here. All right, let me go to another picture here. Another something else that we're looking at here. It's kind of blurry, isn't it? Um, is so you see this pyramid, and then you see basically this adjacent cortex that's associated with it. Okay, this would basically be um, a lobe of the kidney. Okay, a lobe of the kidney. Now, why is that going to be important to know? Well, the the arteries or veins that travel in these you know through these columns in between the lobes of the kidneys, those are called interlobar, you know, what's called vessels, you know, in between the lobes of the kidneys. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Keep that anatomy and that uh, that that uh, terminology in mind. And then the last structure that I uh, kind of forgot to mention, I should have mentioned before, is that basically all these structures in the hilum are going to are gonna be found, you know, they're, they're able to aggregate together in here because of the space called the renal sinus. And normally the renal sinus is, is occupied with adipose tissue, but most of that has been obviously cleaned out of this dissection here. So, but that's all. The, remember, a sinus is just a space, and remember the sinus is kind of in the within the hilum of the 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 entry point of the kidney or exit point of the kidney itself. Okay, so this is kind of so. Hopefully, this video helped uh, give you a better understanding of the uh, functions of the urinary system and the gross anatomy of the kidney. Now, the next one I want to focus on the physiologic or microscopic anatomy of the kidney and talk about the nephron.